Hello, everybody. Good morning. Happy New Year. Oh, let me put my New Year headband on. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I don't know if I'll keep this on the whole time because it's a little tall, but Happy New Year. Anyway, I'm sure by now you have heard about the Steven Tyler lawsuit. I was on the internet, definitely not minding my business the other day, and I saw it was actually late at night. It was like on a Friday night, I think. Um, I saw Rolling Stone had just put out an article that said that Steven Tyler was finally being sued for allegations and frankly admissions that he had made over the past several years. Okay, this is distracting. Yeah. Since this story has, I guess I'll say broken, that he's getting sued, a lot of people have been saying things like, well, this was common knowledge. Well, this was well known. This has been known. This wasn't a secret. And to that, I would say true, but I don't know that it was necessarily like common knowledge. Maybe it's common knowledge among a certain age group of people, but I didn't know that. I did not know that. You know what made me aware of it? was I saw a deep dive about it back in, I think, like August. It's a documentary. I'll, I'll link it below. They kind of go through not only the actual allegations against Steven Tyler outside of this lawsuit, but they also read excerpts word for word from Steven Tyler's book. Steven wrote a book back in 2011, like a memoir. And in it, he says some disgusting things and frankly, like admissions. He basically admits to a lot of very, very disgusting behavior. Now. Directly from page 140 and 141, Steven Tyler wrote, she was 16, she knew how to nasty and there wasn't a hair on it. With my bad self being 26 and she barely old enough to drive and sexy as hell, I just fell madly in love with her. I have gotten my hands on the lawsuit and I got to admit y'all, it was very difficult to find this lawsuit. I had to run searches through the LA court system. First I searched his name, then I searched her name and didn't come up under her name. It was like a whole thing. Yesterday. So I think I might've found the case now. I have been searching around. That's one of the issues. Whenever sources report on things, they're like, oh, exclusive source, exclusive whatever. But it's like, they don't tell you the case number, how to find it, whose name and stuff like that. So this is my fourth or fifth search. It costs $4.95 to search each thing. Um, I just typed in defendant doe. So I'm going to look and see if it's any of these. It looks like it's intentional conduct and it says abuse. I'm going to try the most recent one. So stand by. Um, so I ended up having to spend about $40 to get all these documents because it was a little bit of a trial and error. And I don't understand why in the media they don't just tell you what the case numbers of stuff is. It's like they want to have this like exclusive access to court documents. And I just think that's gross. So of course, I'll be showing y'all here on the screen the case number and stuff if y'all want to look it up. But without further ado, let's go ahead and just pull up the lawsuit and discuss it and look at it together. So it was filed, as you can see at the top, on December 27th, 2020. 2022 and today is January 1st. So four or five days ago, it was filed. And as you can also see, the person representing the plaintiff, that is Julia, the victim, his name is Michael Reck and he works at this Jeff Anderson and Associates law firm. I did not do any research into this Jeff Anderson and Associates law firm, but I think that they have represented victims against the Catholic Church because Julia in her statement, actually we can read her statement as well. She came out and said, you know, I, I've been admiring this law firm for the work that they've been doing, something about Catholic, but maybe they represented the Catholic Church. I don't know. We can look them up if y'all are interested. Here's the case number if you want to look it up yourself. Title of the document is Complaint for Damages for number one, bleep battery, uh, bleep assault, and intentional infliction of emotional distress. Now, intentional infliction of emotional distress is very difficult to prove. Before we get started, I want to address people had been saying, you know, how is she able to sue over something that happened so long ago? Like, hasn't the statute of limitations expired? And Yes, it had expired. But in 2019, the governor of California, Gavin Newsom, signed into law an act that allows victims of childhood abuse such as this to sue. It basically extended the statute of limitations. Basically, it opened a window for people who alleged to be victims of this type of abuse to sue their perpetrators where before they would have actually not been able to do so. 
So that window of opportunity to sue was going to close and has now closed on December 31st, 2022. So yesterday. So the timing of this lawsuit comes right at the very, very finish line of that window of opportunity to sue that had been opened from the act that was signed into law. So she did make it in time, it seems, to do the suing. And she will mention that a little bit in this complaint. So without further ado, let's get into the text. So as you can see here, she does not name Steven Tyler or Aerosmith or anybody, right? She doesn't name names, but it looks like she's suing 50 separate entities or individuals. And there is something really weird about these defendants that I'll show y'all when we get to it that I've never seen before, but maybe, you know, it's common. I just never saw it before. So when you see plaintiff, you're going to think victim. You're going to think Julia, Julia Holcomb. Her name was Holcomb, but now she's changed her last name to Miss Lee. So plaintiff, that's her, is a survivor of childhood bleep abuse, battery, assault, and this word, at the hands of Steven Tyler. He is defendant Doe 1. Now, there's also these other 2 through 50 that she lumps into 1. But when you see defendant Doe 1, from what I understand, she's talking about Steven Tyler. So when plaintiff was 16 years old, Steven Tyler used his role, status, and power as a well-known musician and rock star to gain access to, groom, manipulate, exploit, bleep assault plaintiff over the course of three years in numerous states across the country, including the state of California, County of Los Angeles. As a result, Stevens bleep abuse and assault, Julia has suffered severe emotional, physical, and psychological injury, including humiliation, shame, and guilt, economic loss, economic capacity, earning loss, and permanent emotional distress. So then they discuss the jurisdiction and venue here. We have the jurisdiction to bring this case in this court, in this city, and all that. So here are the parties. Plaintiff is an adult female residing in Texas. She was bleep abused as a minor. She brings this complaint pursuant to California Code of Civil Procedures Section 340.1 as amended by that bill I told y'all about, Assembly Bill 218, for the child bleep assault she's suffered at the hands of defendant. That's Stephen. Thus, Julia's claims for damages suffered as a result of that type of assault are timely because they were filed three years within when the law went into effect and she's over the age of 40. So she has filed a declaration from a mental health practitioner, which I think was sealed because I did not see that. And an attorney declaration for each named defendant in this action. The childhood bleep abuse, harassment, and or assault of plaintiff occurred in numerous states around the country, including California in LA County. Then it goes on to say, Steven Tyler, the alleged perpetrator at all times mentioned, was an adult male individual. By 1973, Steven was a renowned and well-known musician, a leading member of a world-famous rock band. By 1973, he had acquired wealth, stature, and power as a result of his career and status as a rock star. This status afforded him particular power and influence over minors, including plaintiff. Julia alleges that the true names and capacities, whether individual, corporate, associate, or otherwise, of defendants, named herein as does 2 through 50, are unknown to her, who therefore sues the defendants by such fake names. So basically she's saying, I don't know their true names, but I'm going to amend this complaint to put in their true names and what their jobs were and stuff after I've been able to figure out what exactly all their names were. Oh yeah, I remember there was this guy or this girl or this lady or whatever. I don't remember their names, but there's definitely like at least 50 people. And then once I'm able to get through a little bit more of the discovery phase, I'm going to amend this complaint and put those people's names in this complaint. So she's saying, I'm going to name names, but right now I can't remember all their names. Or maybe she never knew them. But each of those defendants is responsible in some manner under California law for the occurrences that she's going to talk about in this lawsuit. And they were a cause of the childhood bleep assault and intentional infliction of emotional distress that resulted in injury to her. So this part is the weird part here. Um, I'm going to get to it here in this paragraph, but I, it's very strange to me. And again, this could be like a, a normal thing and I just never saw it before, but she goes at all times mentioned in here, there was a unity of interest and ownership among defendants and each of them such that any individuality or separateness between these defendants cease to exist. 
So now in this paragraph, she's having to prove why she's suing all these 50 people. Because, you know, whenever they come in with their lawyers, they're going to be saying, well, that wasn't me. That was Steven Tyler. So she's saying, no, mm -mm, no, y'all were all acting together. And then look, look at this next part. Defendants and each of them were the successors and in interest and or alter egos of the other defendants. Each of them in that they purchased, controlled, dominated, operated each other without any separate identity. Again, this could be normal words and verbiage for this type of lawsuit, but I've never seen personally this alter egos in any court filing. To continue maintaining the facade of separate and individual existence between and among defendants and each of them would allow them to perpetrate a fraud and injustice. At all times, defendants and each of them were the agents, representatives, or employees of each and every other defendant. In doing the things here and after alleged, defendants and each of them were acting within the course and scope of their, again, alternative personality, capacity, identity, agency, representation, or employment, and were within the scope of their authority, whether actual or apparent. So I'm not really sure what this whole thing is about. Like defendants were the successors and or alter egos of other defendants. They didn't have any separate identity. And in doing things that they did that I'm talking about in this complaint, they did so in the scope of their alternative personality. I have no idea what that's about. If you are a lawyer familiar with this type of allegation and this type of complaint, if you could comment below, if you ever see anything like this, is this normal? Is this common? Because it's kind of strange to me. So they want to say plaintiff, that's Julia, is informed and believes. And on that basis, alleges that at all times mentioned in here, each of them were the managers, trustees, partners, servants, joint venturers, shareholders, contractors, or employees of each and every other defendant. And the acts and omissions in this complaint were done by them acting individually through such capacity and within the scope of their authority and with the permission and consent of each and every other defendant. And that said conduct was thereafter ratified by each and every other defendant. And each of them is jointly and severally liable to plaintiffs. So that whole thing, I really wanted to get into it because of this alter ego thing. No separate identity, alternative personality. I, I don't know what that's about. It seems very strange, but paragraphs eight and nine are just Julia saying, this is the reason I'm suing 50 people. It's not just Steven Tyler. It's all 50 of these people. They all acted together. And even when they were acting individually, each and every one of them, therefore, went, went back and ratified and, and basically made it okay and consented to that behavior. So, so therefore, they're all liable to me as a victim and they're all just as liable as Steven Tyler. So now this part, I will give you all a little bit of a warning. It is a little bit grotesque and it's, it's not for the faint of heart. I am such a faint of heart type of person, but I feel like it's important to discuss these types of cases. So if you are thinking you might be a little upset, then I would ask you to excuse yourself for the remainder of this video because we're about to get into some stuff. Now she's about to lay out the facts. The first part here is minor plaintiff meets Steven Tyler and is assaulted by him. So now we're going to get into the how they met. In 1973, she came to know an individual who was well known in the music community as associating with girls and young women who would become accessible and susceptible to famous musicians. And this is something that we learned about in the deep dive. If you haven't watched it, I would suggest that you do go watch it. But in the deep dive, they talk about this little O-R-A-L Annie club. And it was basically like this, this madam type lady who would gather up teenage girls and present them in groups to these rock stars. The book basically describes the Little Annie Club as a service that provides young women to rock stars in any costume they desire to fit even the most perverted fantasies. Ran by an older woman who seemingly plucks young underage girls with a rough home life to serve up to these rock stars. Did she lead you into rock and roll or something, or what? She the? sure did. Uh, she 
She was older than I was. You, told me that you if, were 15 at the time. I was 15. I wasn't allowed to go with her to a concert until my 16th birthday, which was just one month before I met Stephen. And that was was that your mother's rule, or was that no? It was because of the law. The like law. she would have taken me if the laws would have allowed me to go, but because in, of the law in I'm, Portland, in Portland. She so I don't know if that's who she's making these allegations against in this complaint, but it seems to line up. She came to know an individual who was well known in the music community, associating with girls and young women who would become accessible and susceptible to famous musicians. In 1973, Steven Tyler performed in Portland, Oregon, and Julia was invited backstage by agents of the defendant, which which one, we don't know. It's just one of those 50 people or entities or alter egos or whatever. This was the first time that Julia met Steven Tyler. Upon information and belief, she had just turned 16 one month earlier. So he was 25, she was 16. So Steven Tyler showed unusual interest in Julia immediately. And after speaking with her backstage, Steven took Julia and another person to his hotel room. He then required the other individual to leave. So he was alone with Julia. Among other topics, Julia and Steven discussed how old Julia was. And Julia informed him of her age. Um, Stephen inquired where Julia's parents were and why she was out all night by herself. So he's asking, where's your parents? He's kind of feeling it out. Julia informed Stephen of the struggles that she was facing at home. So he's, you know, this is like one of those R. Kelly tactics where he would often go after victims who had struggles at home and he would become like sort of a provider or a, an alternative home for them. Steven Tyler performed various acts of criminal bleep conduct on Julia that night. So she was 16, he's 25. Steven Tyler had plaintiffs stay with him in his hotel that night and then sent her home the next morning in a taxi cab. Before she left, Steven invited Julia to Seattle for his band's next concert. So she was in Portland and he invited her to Seattle. He said he would buy the plane ticket so she could travel separately from him since she was a minor and could not travel with him across state lines. So here they're kind of starting to establish a bit of a mens rea, a mental requirement that Stephen knew what he was doing wasn't correct and he knew that he could get in trouble for it. He knew he was breaking a law. I think that's what they're trying to establish here. Julia used the plane ticket provided by Stephen to fly to Seattle for the concert. Stephen had Julia stay in his hotel room after the show that night. And again, he performed various bleep acts upon Julia. So Julia flew back to Portland the next day with a ticket provided by Stephen. After the show in Seattle, they allege, Stephen continued to pursue Julia by frequently phoning her at home, making various statements to her, inducing her to visit him again, including telling her that he wrote a song for her, that he recorded the song with his band and he wished she could be in the recording studio so he could sing it to her. Once Julia finished her sophomore high school year, Stephen caused her to travel to Boston to stay with him. Within a few weeks, Stephen had told Julia that he did not want her to go back to school and he wanted her to stay with him. And he wanted to continue taking her on the road to the concerts with him and his band. And he promised to provide for her as she traveled with him. During this time, he continued to bleep assault Julia. Julia, still a minor at this time, was powerless to resist Stephen's power, fame, and substantial financial ability. Stephen coerced and persuaded Julia into believing that this was a romantic love affair. So that's how they met. So then the complaint goes on into how Stephen becomes Julia's guardian and continues to assault her. It's another example of a guardian using their position of power and violating their fiduciary duty. Now, again, this is all alleged. This is all innocent until proven guilty. But what I will say is he did publish a book in 2011 where he boldface admitted to some of this stuff. Let me know if I should do like a BJ audio book club where I just read the Steven Tyler book. I don't know. Maybe I will. The, the, it might be a little exhausting, but I'm kind of scared to read about myself. So now they just talked about how they met. And now we're going to talk about how he became her guardian, her legal guardian. In approximately 1974, so remember they met in 1973, Stephen and his agents took actions for Stephen to become the guardian for Julia. So he could more easily travel with Julia and avoid criminal prosecution. Stephen met with Julia's mother and convinced her to sign over the guardianship of her daughter to him. 
he made various promises and inducements to the mother, assuring her of the well-being of Julia, including that he promised Julia's mother he would enroll her in school, he would support her and provide her with better medical care and support than her mother could at the time. He did not meaningfully follow through on those promises, and instead he just continued to travel with her, assault her, and provide alcohol and drugs to her. Now, something that some people have been saying on my Instagram comments is like, well, this is really the parents' fault. This is the mother's fault. Where was the mom? Where was the dad? They should have never signed her over. True. But it's not just one person's fault. And I think that's indicative from the fact that Julia isn't just naming Steven Tyler in this complaint. She's naming 50 defendants. A whole team of people had to come together and be complicit and complacent with this in order for it to happen, including Julia's mother. Now, the way that they kind of wrote this complaint here, they're kind of trying to act like, oh, well, he made promises and he didn't keep the promises and stuff like that. And it's like, "Mm -hmm." the mom signed over the guardianship and she shouldn't have done that. But she did. And so let's get into the next part of what happened after that. And again, if this type of content right here where the cursor is right now will make you upset, I again encourage you to leave and excuse yourself from the video. Okay, so the next part we're going to talk about here is Julia gets pregnant and then she is coerced to go ahead and terminate it. So approximately 1975, so this is like two years after they meet, Julia became pregnant as a result of these bleep acts by Steven Tyler causing him to be simultaneously both the father of plaintiff's unborn child and her legal guardian. Okay, this is not good. This is not supposed to happen. Stephen was the sole source of income, transportation, and support for Julia. And when Julia told Stephen that she was pregnant, he instructed her that she could not seek any prenatal medical care because he would get in trouble. Again, more mens rea showing that he had the requisite mental capacity to know that what he was doing was against the law. So he's saying he would get in trouble for being the father of the unborn child when people started asking who the father was at the doctor. So he said, no, I'm not bringing you to the doctor. I'm not bringing you to get no kind of medical care because I'm going to get in trouble when people start asking who's the dad. Julia continued to follow his instructions and commands, and he continued to woo her and exert undue influence over her. By, among other things, informing her that he's writing these songs about her and recording songs about her, referring to her and inspired by her. Okay, so then approximately in the fall of 1975, when Julia was pregnant, Stephen was touring with his band and left Julia alone at home in the Massachusetts apartment. He left her with not a lot of food, not a lot of money, and she didn't have a car. She didn't have a car. So she was basically stuck in this apartment in Massachusetts while Stephen was out on tour with Aerosmith. While she was there, a fire occurred in the apartment and she lost consciousness from inhaling smoke. She regained consciousness in a Catholic hospital with Stephen by her bedside. Medical staff informed them that Julia would make a full recovery and that the baby was not harmed. But Stephen still pressured her and coerced her into terminating by threatening that he would send her back to her family and cease to support and love her if she did not terminate. Agents of Stephen were present and they actually assisted with the arrangement for the termination which needed to be performed at a different facility because the facility she was at was Catholic hospital and they don't be doing that kind of thing over there. Julia relented. She gave in and the termination was performed. So the next part of the story, there's not one part that's worse than the others, but like, imagine like you go through all that and then years and years later, it's brought back up in this way. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Julia made a conscious decision to leave and escape the music and drug addled world, seeking to be free from the sex culture created by Steven Tyler and the industry. Now y'all remember, this is a Lou Taylor client and Lou Taylor likes to act like she's Miss Christian of the year award over here, Miss Christian Lou Taylor. And this is the type of clients that she's representing. So again, it's not a secret that this is how Steven Tyler was acting. It's not a secret that this is almost the brand of the band. Like people know this. It's almost common knowledge as far as a whole age group of people. So Miss Christian Lou Taylor, this is her type of clients and this is the company she likes to keep apparently. So it says, Julia returned back to her home in Portland over the years and she rebuilt her life. She got her GED because remember, she dropped out of high school to be with Stephen. She attended college and she became active in her Christian faith. She met her husband. She got married. She started a family and she started to repair her soul 
through faith and family. Julia became deeply devoted to the Catholic faith, which celebrated the sanctity of life as she sought comfort, counseling, and solace with her priest. So basically, Julia becomes a Catholic, kind of like a, a deeply devoted Catholic. And if you know about Catholicism, maybe you don't, they're very anti you know, terminating pregnancies in this way. And it looks like she went ahead and fell in line with those beliefs. And that's fine. I agree that everybody has the right to their opinions on these types of issues, especially whenever it's somebody who's actually been affected by the issue. So we don't all got to agree. But it basically says, you know, now she would never do such a thing. And she maybe is ashamed of it. As a result of this abuse, she kept her private shame in silence and secrecy. So she was ashamed of what she did. And she changed her mind on that and stuff, which people are allowed to do if they want. Um, and she went about her life. You know, she got married, she had kids. She was Catholic. She's doing all that stuff. Look at the next paragraph. That life was shattered when Stephen made widespread publications and statements for profit. The callous behavior by Stephen Tyler included publishing his memoirs and books, describing his abuse of Julia without her knowledge, she didn't even know what was coming out, and without her consent. The memoirs characterized the child bleep assault of Julia as a romantic loving relationship, but she didn't know this book was coming out. He made statements in the book with the intent of garnering various benefits, including fame and financial benefit for himself, his managers, agents, publishers, without the consent or permission of plaintiff and to her detriment. So again, I'm wondering in 2011 or whatever, when this book came out, was Lou Taylor one of the managers, agents, or publishers? Because if she was, she's literally profiting off of a book of a man doing this type of stuff. And like, she's one of the most powerful agents in Hollywood. As a result of Stephen's statements and writings, Stephen imposed involuntary infamy upon Julia. She suffered and continues to suffer deep emotional harm as a result. This involuntary infamy and public dissemination of her assaults has aggravated and exacerbated the harm caused by the assaults and continues to prevent healing of the trauma and it has created additional trauma. His memoirs and statements confirm and confess the crimes he perpetrated upon plaintiff, including, oh, this is gross. I'm going to read it, but buckle up. This is what Stephen said about Julia in his memoir, according to this lawsuit. She was 16. She knew how to nasty. With my bad self being 26, and she barely old enough to drive and sexy as hell, I just fell madly in love with her. She was my heart's desire, my partner in crimes of passion. Look, this is very interesting that he, I don't mean to laugh at it to make light of it. It's just very uncomfortable. He said, I was so in love. I almost took a teen bride. I went and slept at her parents' house for a couple nights and her parents fell in love with me, signed a paper over, signed a paper over for me to have custody so I wouldn't get arrested if I took her out of state. I took her on tour with me. So this is from the book. Let me look some up. Steven Tyler. Let me see when the book was published. So the book was published January 3rd, 2012. Let me see what how old Steven Tyler was in 2012. So I just typed in Steven Tyler 2012. I don't know if all these pictures are actually from 2012. But at the time that Steven Tyler wrote this book, he was 64 years old. Okay, 64 years old when the book came out in, in 2012, and then 63. So this is kind of like a, a whole nother issue for me is that when the book was published, Stephen was in his 60s. He was in his 60s. So when this abuse allegedly occurred, he was in his 20s, which I still am like, he knew he could get in trouble, even if it wasn't a moral or ethical issue. He knew it was a legal problem. And for me, it was a moral and ethical issue, not only because of the age difference, but because the age difference was compounded by how powerful, famous, popular, and all of that that Stephen was at the time. Top of the fact that he knew that Julia didn't have a very strong home life and, and all of that. Stephen Tyler was 60, 63, 64 years old when he wrote these words. She was 16 and she knew how to nasty with my bad self being 26 and she barely old enough to drive and sexy as hell. I just fell madly in love with her. Like he's still in the 60s talking about a 16 year old like this. I find it to be grotesque. So he gets into taking her on tour with him. 
Now let's move on to the next paragraph. By including Julia's name in the book's acknowledgments, he left readers and the public without any doubt as to Julia's identity. Soon after, Julia was in line at a grocery store and saw a picture of her own self on a tabloid that referred to her as Steven Tyler's teen lover. The caption under her photo read, she was 15 when they fell in love. He's described her as having more legs than a bucket of chicken. Attempts to contact Julia have been unsuccessful. So she went on back about her life. She was being a Catholic. She may have got married. She had kids. She did all this stuff. And then one day she's just in the grocery store line and sees herself on a tabloid as Steven Tyler's teen lover. The article went on to describe certain details, including the fire that nearly killed her and the coerced termination. These were now published along with her status as a victim of S assault, subjecting her to involuntary infamy. Stephen's ongoing pattern of conduct, including lurid references about her, his public statements, his publications, the widespread public interest of his actions, violated Julia's privacy. It required her to make apologies and disclosures to her husband, her children, her family, her friends that she never would have if it were not for the malicious publication of her details in Stephen's book. Julia has suffered specific and additional trauma and damages because of the public statements made by Stephen. Stephen knew or should have known that him publishing the private details of Julia had subjected her to public ridicule, harassment, trauma, aggravation, and continuation of the harm caused by the original assault. As a result of all of this assault, harassment, and abuse, Julia has suffered personal physical injury and will continue to suffer psychological, mental, and emotional distress, including but not limited to depression, anxiety, anger, agitation, loss of appetite, trouble concentrating, feeling degraded, loss of enjoyment of life, guilt, shame, humiliation, embarrassment, fear, fatigue, helplessness, loneliness, nightmares, PTSD, impairment of relationship, loss of self-esteem, sleeplessness, stomach problems, stress, difficulty with trust, and all associated financial or economic injury. These damages were all suffered as general, special, and consequential damages in amount to be proven at trial, so we don't know how much money it's going to be yet. We need experts to weigh in, but no less than the minimum jurisdictional amount of the court, which I don't know what the minimum jurisdictional amount of the court is. So the first cause of action is bleep battery against all defendants, so all 50 of them. Julia realleges and incorporates everything above, between 1973 and 1975, Stephen intentionally, recklessly, and wantonly did acts which were intended to and did result in a harmful and offensive contact with intimate parts of Julia's person. Julia was subjected to multiple instances of assault by Stephen during her time as a minor. Stephen performed all of these acts with the intent to cause harmful or offensive contact with an intimate part of Julia's person and it would offend a reasonable sense of personal dignity. Further, these acts did cause a harmful or offensive contact. So he knew it was going to be harmful, offensive. The acts were harmful, offensive. Any reasonable person would think they were harmful, offensive, and it did in fact cause harm and offense. These acts constituted criminal S conduct pursuant to the California Penal Code. Now, this is important here because she is suing in the civil court. But she's saying this was crimes. She's saying it's not just this, oh, I can sue him thing. It's he actually also violated the criminal code, the penal code. Because of Stephen's position of authority over Julia and because of Julia's emotional and mental state, her young age, she was unable to give meaningful consent to these acts as a direct result of Stephen's actions. Julia sustained serious and permanent injuries to her person all of which are damages in an amount to be shown at trial. In subjecting Julia to the wrongful treatment that is described in this complaint, Stephen acted willfully and maliciously with the intent to harm Julia and in conscious disregard for Julia's rights to constitute malice and oppression under California civil code. Plaintiff is entitled to the recovery of punitive damages in the amount to be determined in the court against Stephen and a sum to be shown according to proof. So that's the first one, S, battery. So battery and assault are two different 
codes. So this is the S, assault. Each count has to be proven in its element. That was battery. Now we're getting to the assault. So Julia realleges everything she already said. Paragraph 35. Stephen, in doing the things that are alleged in here, including intending to subject Julia to numerous instances of abuse, molestation, he intended to cause the harmful or offensive contact with Julia's person, and he intended to put her in imminent apprehension of such contact. So that's probably the definition. Julia was put in imminent apprehension of a harmful or offensive contact by Stephen, and she actually believed that he had the ability to make the contact. Julia did not consent to this intended harmful or offensive contact with her person because she was a minor. She lacked the ability to consent meaningfully to contact with any person under the statute, right? We're talking about the statutory code, which would say that if you are a minor in California, you do not have the legal ability to consent. Now, if you think about it also, I mean, he was her guardian, like that adds a whole nother level onto this. In doing the things that Julia alleges in this complaint, Stephen violated Julia's right of protection from bodily restraint or harm and from personal insult. In doing the things that we talk about in the complaint, Stephen violated his duty pursuant to California Civil Code 1708 to abstain from injuring the person of the plaintiff or infringing upon her rights. And I think this is the guardian. I think I jumped the shark on that one. As a result of the above described conduct, Julia has suffered and continues to suffer great pain of mind and body, shock, emotional distress, physical manifestations of emotional distress, including embarrassment, loss of self-esteem, disgrace, humiliations, and loss of enjoyment of life. She has suffered and will continue to suffer and was prevented and will continue to be prevented from performing daily activities and obtaining the full enjoyment of life. She will sustain loss of earnings and earning capacity and or she will continue to incur expenses for medical and psychological treatment, therapy, and counseling. And then Julia goes on ahead and alleges that Stephen's conduct was oppressive, malicious, despicable. It was intentional and done in conscious disregard for the rights and safety of others. They were carried out with a conscious disregard of plaintiff's right to be free from tortious behavior, entitling Julia to punitive damages against Stephen in an amount appropriate to punish and set an example of Stephen. So she's saying it the amount should be appropriate to punish him, but also to set an example of him. So they're trying to set an example or set a precedent here. The third and final cause of action is intentional infliction of emotional distress. And the intentional infliction of emotional distress is for both of the child assaults causing the ensuing involuntary infamy for the profit. Now, again, this is against all defendants. This isn't just against defendant Doe 1, but she does just kind of name him. And remember earlier, she kind of tied in all these people together and said they're not even separable. Some of them are even maybe alter egos of the other ones. She goes on to say, Stephen intended his outrageous behavior. He knew or he should have known that the extreme emotional distress that occurred would likely result. He consciously and intentionally orchestrated, conducted, and participated in the assaults while she was a minor. In an ongoing pattern of conduct that has existed since the time of the assaults through the present day, Stephen intentionally publicized the acts that he perpetrated upon Julia for his profit and fame. The conduct reached a crescendo when his multiple books were published, describing the assaults of plaintiff and other traumatic and painful private matters for a plaintiff who was a child and a victim of a bleep crime. Stephen knew or should have known plaintiff would be seriously and irreparably harmed. When Stephen's assaults of Julia stopped, he refused to let her heal and keep that abuse private from her community and her family. While Julia had kept her past private, Stephen's conduct included, but was not limited to publishing information about his assaults of Julia that caused the public to identify Julia as a victim of childhood S assault, trauma, and a coerced pregnancy termination. Stephen's conduct, as alleged throughout the complaint, was outrageous in various ways, including that he assaulted Julia and displaying his abuse of her at the time it was occurring, and from that day forward. Because of Stephen's status as a world-famous rock star, he achieved special status and power in the media and the world generally. Stephen abused his position of power, 
afforded to him by fame and describing his assaults of Julia in various media outlets, including but not limited to his books, memoirs, and other public statements, knowing that Julia would be susceptible to mental distress and acting intentionally or unreasonably with full recognition that his acts would cause the mental distress. Stephen's conduct exceeded all bounds of decency and is odious and utterly intolerable in a civilized society. His conduct was intentional and reckless. His conduct caused emotional distress in the minor, Julia, and this emotional distress was and continues to be severe and extreme. As a result of the above described conduct, plaintiff Julia has suffered and continues to suffer and, you know, all these symptoms again. As a result of all this conduct above, Julia has against her will become a central figure in a scandal that has deprived her of the ability to proceed under a pseudonym or Jane Doe in this very lawsuit because confidentiality of her identity, likeness, and privacy rights normally would be afforded to a victim of this type of crimes. But it was ripped aside by Stephen Tyler's actions. Stephen Tyler forced upon Julia a constant state of involuntary infamy. This infamy manifests as disgrace, dishonor, disrepute, and feeling a constant state of being known for a depraved and shameful bleep act, when in reality, Julia was the victim of a bad act. Childhood blank assault. As a result of the above noted conduct, Julia was required to make disclosures of private, traumatic, painful, and personal nature from her personal life that would not have been made otherwise. These disclosures caused plaintiff extreme and ongoing damages and pain and suffering. So then they go on to the prayer for relief and say, Julia prays for judgment against defendants, all of them, as follows. For past, present, and future general damages in an amount to be determined, um, special damages, future lost earnings, economic damages, any appropriate statutory damages, including attorney's fees, um, the costs of the suit, the court costs, pre and post judgments and interest as allowed by law, attorney's fees pursuant to the statutes and otherwise allowable by law, for exemplary damages, meaning make an example out of him, punitive damages in an amount to be determined at trial, for disgorgement of all monies and profits derived from defendant's memoirs, statements, and publications. So she wants money from the memoirs that he made because she was involuntarily outed as the victim. And for such other further relief as the court may deem proper. That is the end of that particular lawsuit filing. I know this video is getting long, but this is such an important issue. I really want to put in here along with it, Julia's public statement. So Julia has released, the victim here, the plaintiff, has released a public statement through her lawyers. She has said in the statement that this is going to be her only statement on the matter. So I want to pull that up and read it. I want it to live historically along with this complaint because I think it's important to allow her to have her voice. And this is the way that she has chosen to express her voice outside of the courts. Below is the official statement from courageous survivor Julia Misley, formerly Julia Holcomb. Regarding her experience of being groomed, exploited, and s abused by a singer of a world famous rock band as a minor. She says, My name is Julia Misley, formerly Julia Holcomb. I am making this statement because at the age of 65, I have discovered that through a recent change in the law, I have a new opportunity to take legal action against those that abuse me in my youth. I want this action to expose an industry that protects celebrity offenders, to cleanse and hold accountable an industry that both exploited and allowed me to be exploited for years, along with so many other naive and vulnerable kids and adults. Julia says, because I know that I am not the only one who suffered abuse in the music industry. I feel it is time for me to take this stand and bring this action to speak up and stand in solidarity with other survivors. I hope that from this action, we can make the music industry safer, expose the predators in it, and expose those forces in the industry that have both enabled and created a culture of permissiveness and self-protection of themselves and the celebrity offenders among them.
The complaint that has been prepared by my legal team recites in legal terms the trajectory of my life from early struggles to exploitation by Steven Tyler, the music industry, my escape from that world, my recovery and transformation, my restoration of spirit through faith, the building of a family, and the rebuilding of my life. The complaint also recites how Tyler, for profit and more fame, re-traumatized me and my family. I am grateful for this new opportunity to take action and be heard. My own recovery came through my Catholic faith. For years, I have watched Jeff Anderson and his firm make a difference in creating a safer place in the Roman Catholic Church and in faith communities across this country. I've been able to see how things within the church have improved because of those legal efforts. I recently learned that the law in California opened a window of opportunity for me and other survivors to bring action and to have our voices heard in a way that we had not before. And that led me to Jeff Anderson and his team. I believe that together we can make a difference. My voice can be heard and become a part of the cleansing of an industry that needs to be both exposed and held accountable. I am publicly releasing this statement with the intention of making no further statements or interviews. Please contact my legal team, Jeff Anderson and Associates, with questions and requests. And we have Jeff Anderson, Mike Reck, and Karen Menzies for the contact information. So that is all that I have for today as far as reading the complaint and going through the allegations. It is pretty vile. It is pretty bad. And to be honest, I don't love talking about it, but we have to, because just like Julia said, this is an industry that needs to be cleansed. Now she says for her, that was through her Catholic faith, through others, it may be through a different method and a different route, but we do need to start calling the stuff what it was. This was not a romantic love affair. And this is why we have laws that put the age of consent around 18. Now, we could certainly get into arguments whether the age of consent should be raised, should be lowered. The reality is a lot of people make decisions when they are 16, when they are 15, when they are 17, that once they reach adulthood, once their frontal lobe is fully developed, they realize exactly all the variables of the situation that they were not able to realize when they were in it. For all of the complaining that I do about statutory changes and lobbyist groups changing laws, I have to acknowledge that I believe in my personal opinion that this law being changed, this window of opportunity being opened was a good thing, especially in this particular case, in this particular instance, because Julia maybe would have been fine to just let this whole thing go. She did not tell the people in her life about all of this stuff because she was ashamed. Now, I don't believe that Julia should be ashamed of what happened because it's explainable and it's justified based on the circumstances of what had gone on. But if Julia is ashamed, who the hell am I to tell her as the victim of these crimes that she shouldn't be, right? So who am I to tell her how she should handle the situation now as a grown adult? But Stephen then later on came out and published his memoir, just 10 years ago, that named Julia. She was on the front page of tabloids. At that point, she was trying to be like this devout Catholic. She had a husband, she had kids, she had her whole thing going on. And it's like, I can't imagine how that's fair for him to continue dragging this up, but it's not fair for her to be able to sue for it. I'm very pleased that Julia was able to get her complaint filed in time. And I am certainly looking forward to following along on this case. I definitely am interested in seeing what Steven Tyler's lawyer's reaction to this lawsuit is going to be. And I am certainly looking forward to the outcome of this case. Now, I will say a lot of cases of this type end up getting settled. NDAs or non-disclosure agreements are filed. And I, I can imagine that that is a possible eventual outcome here. From a sort of selfish perspective, I would like for this case to go all the way. I would like for Julia to win. I would like for Steven to have to pay her a lot of money. But from a human perspective and an empathy perspective, I can totally understand how it will be painful and traumatic for her to continuously go along with this lawsuit because We see how victims and alleged victims are treated in lawsuits and how the questions go and how they're re-traumatized and re-abused in these cases. So 
Hopefully it doesn't end up happening like that for Julia. I'm hoping that she has a very supportive team around her, both legal team and family and community. I'm hoping no one is judging her, making her feel ashamed or humiliated or embarrassed about this stuff, because frankly, in my opinion, she should not feel that way. It's clear to me that she was not around a bunch of adults who had any damn sense. They were signing away her legal rights to some grown man who was, you know, doing drugs and drinking and every other, had, had every other thing going on. She wasn't taken care of. She wasn't cared for. She wasn't protected. And I am standing with Julia. Listen, we definitely disagree on a lot of stuff. I haven't done a lot of research on Julia, but the research I have done shows that politically we do not have the same opinions. Ethically, morally, we don't even seem to necessarily have exactly the same compass, but that doesn't matter. What matters is she was wronged and she deserves justice. And at the very minimum, the story deserves to be told for what it is and not covered in this smoke screen of, oh, it was a romantic relationship. No, it was not. It was coercion and it was abuse. I stand with Julia and I hope that she is able to get some peace of mind, some version of justice. And if she can't get either one of those, I hope she does get a lot of money. Money doesn't buy happiness, but it does send a message to the rest of these people who think that they're going to keep acting like this. The tides have turned and the times have changed. This wasn't no, she was 16 and knew how to nasty. That's disgusting. It's vile. It's depraved and deranged. Let's start calling it what it is, y'all. Because if we don't, we are doomed and condemned to repeat this over and over. This child abuse. And I will be damned if I leave this world not having done every single thing that I could to change that culture starting with highlighting cases like this. In the meantime, facts ain't defamation. Love you, mean it. K-bye.